Well, here we are. Wow, Martin, Yay. so glad to have you right here <laughs> with us. Lovely. Wow, I think we are going to have a good discussion. We are. Albert, and, uh, you and I enjoy this stuff at a great level. Wait, we have three chapters. I know. Three chapters at 9, 10 and 11. Right. They're the difficult ones too and there's no sermon. So if I were you, everybody who's watching this, maybe go get yourself a cup of coffee and some biscuits because you're <laughs> going to be here for a while. Okay. <laughs> That's a good way to enjoy our fellowship. <laughs> yes, it is. Okay, so Martin, you and I went to Israel together. We did. And we went to Greece and Turkey Yeah, we together. did. We did indeed. And the only place we did not go is, is Rome. Rome. No. So maybe we should pray for a trip there. I think so, yes. I and guess we need to say hi to Paul sometime. We need to say hi to Paul, yes. And maybe just pop in and visit the Pope. Okay. I mean, send greetings from our yeah. senior pastor. I okay, think that'd be let's good. do that. Okay. Okay, so Martin, I have a question to kickstart it. Yeah. So when I grew up as a Christian, when I read the book of Romans, I will start with chapter one all the way to eight. <laughs> and then I will skip 9, 10, 11, and I will go to 12. I might end at 14 or 15. Am I abnormal? Uh, no, no. You, you Actually, I think people... They read, <laughs> people who are going to read Romans anyway, uh, they get to the high point of chapter 8, and chapter 8 finishes on this magnificent reassurance. There's nothing that can separate us from God. And then they get to the start of chapter 9, and they think, oh dear, that's really right. going to... And, and so they just skip through it. And anyway, mm. it seems to be all about... Israel, and that doesn't seem to be anything to do with me, so I'll go straight to 12, exactly. which is about the way I should live. Right, so how does 9, 10, 11 fit into the whole book of Romans? Well, interestingly, uh, quite a few people over the period of history have thought that it's some kind of addition, it's something that Paul wrote later and put in, or whatever. But actually, the truth to tell is it fits in uh, magnificently mm. with what Paul is trying to do. If you look at the theme of the letter, um, the, the, the summary in chapter 1, uh, verse 16 and 17, that uh, the, the gospel is the righteousness of God revealed. And so what he's doing right the way through, he's showing the plan of God as the cre great creator God. God creates uh, the world. He uh, Obviously, human beings have fallen away from grace uh, and that, that's created an enormous problem. So he needs to answer that. So he sets his plan in motion. And his plan is that through a people whom he calls through Abraham and then through the covenant law with Moses, but they, that's not the end of the plan. Mm. That's the process of the plan. Right. The plan is ultimately through the Messiah Jesus to bring humanity into a place where they can access back into the presence of right, God. Right, right. And therefore... Uh, the, the whole business of what is Israel, why were they called, why are they the chosen people, what's the point of that, and, and how does that fit in with Christ uh, and the whole point of the, the new Israel, hmm. the new, new creation, how does that work? So right. he's got to explain that before he can get to how should we behave. Right, yeah, yeah that, that's really good. You know, when I read uh, this whole book in, in one sentence, yeah. I also realized that once Paul gets to the end of chapter 8, um, there is a mood, you know, talking about the future glory, talking oh, about how great God's oh, yeah. love is. Mm. But once he gets to chapter 9, there is a change of mood. There is. He suddenly becomes very sad. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Do, do you have any idea what, what's going on here? It, uh, well, in many ways, actually, Paul, I, I think what we, we sometimes forget a bit is that Paul was very proud of being a rabbinic Jew. Right. He, right. He, obviously, he's using it all in the glory and the graciousness of God. But his training and the way he thinks and the way he writes is thoroughly Jewish, thoroughly rabbinic. Hmm. And if you one looks at the Psalms, uh, the, the Psalms move very easily from praise into hmm. lament to what are you doing, God? Why is this? In the same way the book of Job does. Job moves from praise to what's happening to me and and actually paul is being so very very honest because he's expressing interestingly what people were thinking anyway why is it not got any better mm. surely god is doing right. something for his people and right. so he's being 
very rabbinic about it. Yeah, you know, I, I totally agree with you. And I think Paul, you know, as I always joke about, you know, Paul <laughs> is not a theologian sitting in a library no, writing a no, thesis. No. He's a pastor. He's yeah. a missionary. So I somehow was under the impression that when Paul moved from chapter 8 to chapter 9, he became very sad. And there is a reason for yes. that. Yes. So this is my speculation. So Paul is an apostle to the Gentiles. Uh, right. If you read the book of Acts, anywhere Paul goes, there are Gentiles Correct. coming to Christ. Correct. So you go here, you go here. People just came to Christ. Yeah. But at the same time, anytime Paul goes to any place, the Jewish people, the Israelites, they oppose him. That's right. And so, as Paul laid out the theology right here from chapter 1 to chapter 8, he was talking about how God opens up the avenue of salvation to mm. those who have mm. faith in Christ. And he suddenly think about his own people. Yeah. How about my own people? Yeah. Why are so many Gentiles coming to Christ? Correct. And why are my people still rejecting God? Mm. And mm. so that's why he, come, he becomes so sad. And he even said at night too, I have great sorrow so, and yeah. unease, unceasing anguish in my heart. Yeah. So yeah. Paul is actually not just talking about a theology. He also has a lot of his, his emotions um, going into this whole segment as well. Absolutely. And of course, we, as we both know, from where is it that he talks about um, Tertius? Uh, um, is, I think is, 16, 16, 16, 17. Yes, yes. So, uh, you know, he said, oh, I, Tertius, am writing this. We, we need to remember, Paul didn't actually write anything. Right. Paul just dictated this. And he's, he's thinking it through. And he's probably pacing up and down. And, and he gets to this point. And, and there's, there's no way that you can actually disguise the sadness. Right. And it comes over in what he's saying. Right, and, right. And that, that is, is brilliant, of course. Okay, so he, his love for his own people yeah. and his anguish for his own people yeah. just yeah. come out right here. Okay, so Martin, I think what Paul is trying to do in chapter 9 is to establish the fact that God is sovereign. When he looks at his own people, the fact that his own people is still denying Christ he goes back all the way to the Old Testament and say, no, the Abraham calling is still here. God's election of Jacob, the people of Israel, is still here. The problem is some of the people are not believing yet. And so Correct. that's why he said not all Israel is Israel. Is Israel. No. So I think Paul is trying to establish that part in the argument right here. Absolutely. And and in chapter 9, he really establishes, I mean, there, there are a couple of words he uses, the, hmm. the word election and calling and uh, and. and things being reckoned uh, and this all these terms actually have been used in particular theological directions right. but the truth of the matter is the way that Paul is using the Old Testament and Paul uses the Old Testament in a variety of ways hmm. but in this particular context the simp simply the way he uses it he's talking about the calling of a people right this right. is this is God's plan working out that he's he's calling the people through the patriarchs hmm. he's and uh, and, and that, yes, that relates to the history of individuals, as you rightly point out. Mm. But it is through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the patriarchs, that the people are called. That's their genealogical right. history. Right. He will go in a little bit later on to show that actually there is the, the legal calling, the covenant with Moses. But those two strains come together powerfully um, because he's called the people for a purpose. So this is not really about individual, individual salvation. Plan. This is about his salvation plan through history. Okay, so now that we establish chapter 9 yeah. as emphasizing God's sovereignty, his un unfailing faithfulness to his people, yeah. and also God's election of the people of Israel to Correct. carry out his mission. Martin, help me with chapter 10. <laughs> Man, chapter 10 is difficult. Can you explain to me why Paul said this and why Paul quoted the Old Testament so much? Well, because he's, now he's trying to round it out a little bit more. Um, as always with Paul, he, 
he makes a, a series of points and then he expands it. Hmm. And he's been doing that right the way through. Paul's logic is the way he works out. He does it through this wonderful conversational rhetorical squad, this, this imagined person. Right. Um, and he then speaks about the fact that the, the, the Jews, the Israelites, if you will, um, have, they should have recognized God that they didn't. They right. relay on their own knowledge um, that they should have recognized who Jesus was. They should mm. have been, been able to recognize the Christ, and they didn't. Why? Because they fell back. They didn't realize, they didn't understand that whilst they are part of the plan, they are not the be-all and end-all of the plan. Mm. They are not the culmination of the plan. Right, They're right. part of it. They refuse to accept that, and therefore they refuse to accept Christ. Hmm. Now, what then Paul does is he unites the the law through Deuteronomy right, right. and Christ. And the way he does it, he uses it by, by moving certain bits of, of Scripture into his understanding. Now, Deuteronomy chapter 30 is a, a, a pretty critical chapter to the whole hmm. development, the covenant, the agreement. This is where the sign on this line, right, everybody. Right. This is your chance. It culminates in God giving the people a choice. Choose life or choose death. Hmm. But what he says about the law, what Moses says about the law, is it's not up in heaven that you've got to go up to get it. It's not down in the depths of the sea hmm. uh, where you've got to go down to the deep depths and get it. It's actually in your mouth. Hmm. It is with your mouth and your heart that you right. will make your commitment. Right. This is not such a great thing. Now, what Paul then does is he takes those words and applies them to Jesus. Hmm. And, and that's why he says, do not say in your heart who will ascend to heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the deep to bring Christ up hmm. from the dead. What does it say? He says, the word is near you. The word is in your mouth and in your heart. And then he goes on to talk about if you confess with your mouth then that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Hmm. In other words, sit in the same way that if you said obey, you will, will obey the law with your heart and mouth, fine. If you say that Jesus is Lord because he is the culmination of the law, then you will be saved. That's what you've got to do. There's no alternative, Israelites. Hmm. Right. But not all Israelites accepted the good news. Right. You know, that is really fascinating because Paul was taking um, text from the Old Testament, mm. but then interpret in such a way that explain how the Gentiles are able to come to Christ. Yes. So we, we just establish that not all Israel are Israel. No. But then you just establish that it is by faith. You know, we confess yes, our yes, faith in Christ. Yes. So this really moved the gospel from just a Israel centered or Israel exclusive ram into a universal ram. That's right. Because he's, when he rounded out chapter nine, he quoting um, uh, Hosea and, and Isaiah, and he says, you know, those who were called not my people, I will call my right, people. Exactly. Those who are, and, okay, all right, the context of Hosea was talking about the northern Israelites, but again, Paul moves it to say, well, actually, God can call whom he wants. I will call not my people, my people. Right. Okay, so coming back to Paul. Right. So he was in such an emotional, sad, anguished state. You know, yeah. how about my people? And then he moved from chapter 9 to chapter 10. And then now at 11, he talks about remnant. He's, he's trying to, because he, he starts 11 with a pretty dynamic question. Does, did God reject his people? And to, obviously he answers no. Hmm. So now he needs to explain that, right. particularly to a group, as you said, a group of Gentiles who probably don't get all this. Um, in Israel's history, uh, as we know from the books of Kings and, 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 and the prophets, um, God continually telling people because of their faithlessness, look, if you don't respond to this, if you don't obey the covenant, you are going to be kicked out. Mm. You are going to leave. 
Mm. And uh, even Deuteronomy spoke of that. You right. don't obey it, then you're going to get kicked out. And of course, that is what happened. And whilst a lot of people were, were killed and many people were exiled, the, the people that were exiled weren't all faithless. The people mm. that were exiled, many of them were actually the faithful. Right, right. And what God speaks through Isaiah and Jeremiah particularly is that God will bring a group back right. to the promised land. And that is the remnant. That is what they're called, the I will save a remnant. A little bit like um, Elijah in that wonderful moment yes, exactly. uh, where yeah. he has that sort of faith failure after the great victory on Carmel. He goes running away and then he's, he's on uh, in the Sinai desert and he goes, oh, I'm the only one, there's nobody left. And God says, no, actually, Elijah, you're not. There are mm. 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Right. And, um, and, and so even within faithless Israel right. uh, at the time, there were 7,000 people, a perfect number, of course, who had not bowed the knee. Bowed the, that's a remnant. Okay, so a remnant is a group of people who, who remain are still faithful, faithful yes. to God. Yeah. Okay, so as he moves into chapter 11, he talks about this olive tree, the natural Correct. olive tree. So a group of unfaithful Israelites mm -hmm. are taken off, you know, just like the branches being cut, cut off. off. Yeah. And then a group of Gentiles, they graft in. That's right. So that is the group of Gentiles who believe in Jesus. And because of the Abrahamic covenant, this group of Gentile Christians are being grafted in, in a metaphorical Correct, way. Correct, yeah. And it becomes one single tree, so yeah. one single people of God. Yeah, yeah. But as Paul moved towards the end of the letter, it seems like he is very positive about the future of Israel. Oh, he is, uh, because, it, you know, he comes back to this rather interesting horticultural point where uh, he reverses it. You Normally, you you grafted a, a, a cultivated branch into a wild one because that makes it stronger. But he's saying, oh, no, we got the cultivated plant. We're going to put mm. the wild one in. And he says, Gentiles, don't be too cocky. Don't be too full right, of yourselves right. because God can graft back in yeah. the people. Okay, yeah. so, you know, be prepared. And I think that was one of the things that we, we started with, this this idea that the, that, uh, the Jews uh, had been kicked out of Rome and had been brought back in five years later. And so there were a lot less of them and a lot more Gentiles. Mm. And so there's a possibility there, as you say, the Gentiles, uh, the Gentile church had become a little bit, mm, you know, the, the Jewish church, down market, you know, yes, you, you've come back. But, and so he's really trying to answer that problem. But the deeper problem mm. that he's, mm. he's getting to is that, he, he ends on this, this note that the plan is never to close the door mm, on Israel. Right. He's not replaced them. Right. He is simply saying that the plan is that all of Israel will be saved. Why? Because as we go out and we preach to the Gentiles, as we, we preach to everybody, um, then so all Israel will be saved. In other words they will see the wonderful nature of, of right. Christ in the gospel that they will want that story and they will come back in. Right. That's you, Paul's hope. I, I really like how we end here. You know, so chapter 9 started as being so sad, yes. right? But in the end, when Paul talks about this, there is full of hope. Yes. You know, God has not forgotten no, his people. No. And in fact, God opens up the salvation to the Gentiles Absolutely. as well. So, you know, I, I look at it and I say, oh, the church in Rome is, it actually looks like an international church. Oh, yeah. With the Jewish people and the Gentile, and the Gentile people. people. And it is full of hope because yeah. God's salvation is for everybody who are willing to put their faith in Christ. Yeah. yeah. And Paul ends with all the death of the oh, riches of the yes. wisdom and the knowledge, knowledge of, of God. God. That is so cool. And that is a great ending of chapter 11. It is. And if you, uh, if you read, the, <laughs> if you ignore chapter differences and verse mm. differences, you take them away and you go from the end of chapter eight, which is this magnificent, uh, wonderful, as we said, wonderful finish to that point. Then he finishes on the same point and you suddenly realize that he's bookended nine to 10 and most of 11 right. between these two glorious statements, these right. wonderful statements. Isn't it magnificent that nothing can separate us? Who can know the mind of God? Right. And 
he ends on that absolutely brilliant point and then goes into, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, to offer yourselves as a living sacrifice. Right, it's right. the culmination of two glorious endings to two major theological points that he can say, okay, now you've got to the top of the mountain. I urge you. Right. Well, that is the perfect ending of our conversation it today. Is, I think. And Martin, I hope one day we will travel to Rome together yep. and to say hi to Paul. And so do I. Thank you very much, Thank Albert. you very much, Martin. Great.